Um, so yes, today we'll be talking about some new work uh, we've started discussing together uh, quite recently. So it's quite new, uh, open at the moment, and we're looking forward to some good discussions with you all today. So uh, on the next slide, uh, this is an overview of the talk for today. Uh, we'll start by briefly discussing um, the singularities in general relativity. So Seb will take this part. Uh, so the curvature singularities, geodesic incompleteness, and whether or not they're, they're problematic to what extent as well. We'll then look at the singularities in quantum field theory. Again, pretty briefly. Uh, uh, but what we're really interested in is these four attitudes that we've found towards these singularities. So we did a, a literature survey checking the what's been going on in physics and how people have responded to these different singularities, how they're being used uh, in quantum gravity. And we found four different attitudes. Three of these have already been kind of recognized already uh, in the literature by Ehrman, for instance. Um, but we're doing more by actually tying it into the, the new research and taking it from the literature, finding examples here. And in the last part, this is the really sketchy part, is the, the discussion of to what extent these different attitudes are motivated, are some better than others? Uh, should we take particular attitudes, uh, different attitudes towards different singularities and so on? So yeah, that's... Uh, some general remarks here uh, that we'd like to discuss with you all. So I'll now hand it over to Sebastian, who'll describe the singularities in GR. Uh, so yeah, uh, like um, Karen said, we start with singularities in GR. Um, and uh, well, usually, um, I mean, gener generally singularities are viewed as, as pathologies of the space time. But one striking thing is that uh, there are singularities of various kinds. So there is not one um, single type of singularity, but there are various ways in which space times can be singular. Um, John Ehrman, for example, talks about a large family of conceptually distinct but interrelated pathologies uh, that can affect relativistic space time. And uh, we will discuss two main classes, which are the ones that are most uh, dominant in the literature that we've looked at. Uh, but I should notice that uh, Curiel, in his uh, very helpful um, entry in the uh, Standard Encyclopedia uh, of Philosophy, um, he discusses two other two other types of singularities, which we will not go into here. And, and also Ehrman himself also discusses other types. So the first is uh, geodesic incompleteness. Um, so space-time is regarded as singular, if and only if it contains an incomplete inextendable time-like geodesic. So uh, it is singular if, if it contains a, a time-like geodesic that is, that is incomplete, uh, which means that it ends at some finite proper time. And it is also inextendable in the sense that it, it cannot be extended uh, further. Um, so that's kind of the standard uh, definition of, of, of uh, or, or the official definition of, of singularities in, in physics. Um, for example, in figures in the Penrose Hawking uh, theorems, there's a, a second type of singularity, which is of, of uh, interest to us, which, uh, which are curvature singularities, where uh, the Riemann tensor is unbounded along some curve. Um, so the curvature, we said the curvature blows up. And it can basically happen in, in two ways. It could be that a scalar polynomial of the curvature blows up, so an invariant of the curvature, um, a, a scalar quantity. But it could also be that uh, the scalar quantities uh, are, are regular, do not blow up. Uh, but nevertheless, some of the components of the Riemann, of the Riemann tensor diverge in whichever frame uh, you choose uh, and, and, and that they diverge at finite, affine uh, distances. Um, now this, this discussion of singularities usually assumes that the um, essential singularities are these interesting ones. So the ones that cannot be removed by extended, by extending the, the space time. Uh, so it is regarded that, it is considered that 
if we can extend this the space time then um, the singularity is not is not really uh, interesting as such because we, we can remove it simply by going to a larger uh, embedding uh, the space time into a larger space time so those are uh, the main uh, types and I will say a bit more about about both um, so geodesic incompleteness like I said is the official definition um, I should say though that in the literature that we have looked at on quantum gravity um, this type is um, of is, is less often cited so it, it seems to play less of an important role um, the the intuition behind geodesic incompleteness is that uh, singular points where the metric tensor is not well defined have been cut out of the space time so if we begin with a space time that uh, has some region where the uh, the metric tensor is not well defined then we can we can remove uh, that region or, or those points that's the basic intuition behind this. And this is the intuition that Hawking and Ellis here in this text, um, that they express in this text, geodesic incompleteness has an immediate physical significance in, in that it presents the possibility that there could be freely moving obs observers or particles whose histories did not exist after or before a finite interval of or proper time. This would appear to be an even more objectionable objectionable feature than infinite curvature. And so it seems appropriate to regard such a space as singular. Curiel, for example, in a paper in 1999, he, uh, he um, agrees that there is a physical worry here because it would mean that particles could pop in and out of existence right in the middle of a singular space time. Um, and, and the space time itself can, would come to an end though no fundamental physical mechanism or process is known that could produce such effects. On the other hand, uh, Ehrman is a bit more skeptic. He, uh, at least in some places, he says, this choice quite frankly seems to have been guided by expediency. This is the sense that most easily lends itself to proofs of the existence of singularities. That is indeed the case that, that uh, the proofs of singularities rely on this kind of, of definition of, of a singularity. Um, now, about wh what is the relation between geodesic incompleteness and um, curvature singularities, which I will talk about next? Well, there are different views about these. About this, um, Ehrman says that curvature singularities lead to geodesic incompleteness, and, and in fact, various authors make this suggestion that whenever you have a curvature singularity, then your, your space-time ends there, and so in particular, also your geodesic should end there. Um, and so that for that reason, geodesic incompleteness is taken as a natural uh, view on singularities. But for example, but, uh, for example, Curiel says that the two notions are independent of each other and, and, and mentions examples of both. Um, so, so there is uh, still debate about this, although Curiel's paper is of course the more, more recent uh, on this topic. Uh, for us, this will not really be uh, important because like I said, um, in, in, in a large part of the talk, we will focus on, on curvature uh, singularities, which yeah, the, despite the official definition of, of singularities using geodesic incompleteness, it appears that these are the ones that at least uh, workers in, in quantum gravity, people working in quantum gravity um, worry about uh, the most. Uh, so they are seen uh, to be as the, the most problematic. And the main reason uh, appears to be an effective field theory argument, which I will present in a moment. Um, also, I should mention that um, curvature singularities seem to be somewhat um, less dependent on how you probe the space time. So the notion of geodesic incompleteness is uh, tightly uh, tied to uh, the notion of a point particle. So we consider time-like geodesics on the space-time, uh, potentially representing point particles. Um, but for example, if you consider strings, then strings uh, could be insensitive to some of these singularities. And so it could be that, and, and it, it, in fact, it uh, appears to happen that some singularities are singular for uh, point particles, but not, uh, not if you probe them with strings. Um, so this is this is uh, something that uh, doesn't necessarily happen with with uh, 
curvature singularities. Um, these have been discussed in less detail in the, in the philosophical literature. Curiel does uh, mention them. He discusses the, the problems associated with having uh, unbounded tidal forces so that you, near a singularity, um, the tidal forces that shrink uh, the, the size of an, of an object to zero would, be, would, would grow unbounded. Um, and so that, that it is problem, they are problematic uh, for that reason. Now, what is the, the argument from effect in field theory that, that I mentioned uh, in a, uh, a, a moment ago? It is a semi-classical well, argument by which, uh, so the word semi-classical is often used in terms of you have the Einstein equations and you add to the right-hand side a stress energy tensor, which is the um, expectation value of the quantum stress energy tensor uh, renormalized, uh, uh, calculated on an appropriate state. Um, and this is an a stretch energy tensor for the matter fields, and, and it will give you the back reaction of the quantum field from the space time. That's one uh, conception of semi classical. This is not the conception uh, that, I, that we have in mind here in this, in this argument. What we mean here by um, semi classical is that. Um, we, we derive corrections to the classical action, so, the, so in this case, the, the Einstein-Hilbert action from an underlying quantum theory, so from, from an underlying quantum gravity theory. And we do that uh, typically uh, perturbatively. So suppose that the underlying quantum gravity theory has a small length scale L. It could be the Planck length, uh, or it could be some other length scale in the theory. Then uh, one might expect, in general, the quantum corrections uh, to the action uh, to, to be of the form given here on, on dimensional ground. So to be uh, proportional to powers of the curvature, the curvature square, and, and pa higher powers. So here, um, alpha is a dimensionless parameter. And so since the curvature uh, has dimensions uh, 1 over length squared, this combination here um, has the same, same dimensions as the Ricci uh, scalar itself. Um, so R squared here indicates any linear combination of squares of the Riemann tensor uh, and its contractions. Also, covariant derivatives are also allowed. Um, the parameter alpha is, uh, like I said, dimensionless, but in some cases, in some theories, it contains information about the, well, it always contains information about the microscopic theory, but in some theories, it might be a function of, of, some, of, of uh, some other fields in string theory, for example, the, the Dilaton uh, field. Now, these corrections um, are, in principle, or can be regarded to be purely gravitational. Even in the case of string theory, where there is a Dilaton field, uh, it's, it's, it's not really, uh, one can always take this, this field to be constant. So, so these, uh, we, the, these corrections here are, uh, are gravitational, do not require the, the presence of matter field for, for, for them to appear. Of course, you could have, in addition, matter fields, and then these matter fields will also appear. Uh, but you have them already at the level of, of pure, uh, pure gravity. So that's the effect, uh, the idea of the uh, uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action regarded as the lowest uh, lowest contribution to the quantum effective action. Now, the corrections are small. Uh, these higher order terms are small when the curvature is small compared to this length scale L. So if L squared times R is, is much smaller than one. Uh, so this signals that we, are, that we have an EFT, uh, effective fuel theory, approach, uh, we consider the effective action at sufficiently large uh, length scales so that these terms will indeed be small corrections. They should not dominate the action. Um, however, the, the problem is that near a singularity, the curvature will be large. Um, and so these terms cannot be neglected. Um, so if, if these terms are there, they will be large near singularity in general. Um, so that, that's not what we assume, or what, what one assumes when one uses just the Einstein-Hilbert action. 
Um, so, so if one simply uses the einstein hilbert action, one assumes that these terms are small, but they are, they are not small uh, near singularity. For example, near the Schwarzschild singularity. Um, now, the, the argument is, is, is in more detail goes as follows. We integrate over the whole space-time action, uh, over the, sorry, over the whole space-time in the action, uh, as you saw in the previous slide. But if there are regions of high curvature, then we cannot neglect this, co this correction. So these corrections uh, will not be small in those regions. Um, and so Einstein's equations, which are derived from the action, are only valid in regions of small curvature. Uh, because in regions of high curvature, the, the higher order terms will contribute more than the leading terms. Um, Okay, so I should notice, by the way, that this, this argument, even though it's best presented in the Lagrangian formalism, it, do, it doesn't really require the Lagrangian formalism or the action. It can be equally well be presented purely in terms of the equations of motion. Now, the equations um, that, that led us to derive the existence of a singularity, namely the Einstein, the, the Einstein equations, cannot therefore be trusted near that region because near that region, the higher order terms will be important. important. So there is an inconsistency of the approximation. The existence of the singularity is predicted by a set of approximate equations that are invalid near the singularity. In other words, we have our Einstein equations. From there, we find some models that have singularities that predict there will, will, be, will be singularities. But then we find that if we take the, the full theory, actually those equations are rendered invalid in, in regions that have that property. So this kind of thing, the, uh, the argument says that this kind of singularity is therefore undesirable in the effective field theory uh, approach because we cannot, uh, we cannot derive the existence of such singularities in the first place. If such singularities um, occur, then they will, uh, they will not be solutions of the model we, we started with. So the putative singular model is in general not a model of the full theory with the correction. So that's another way of, of saying that. Okay, so this is um, the argument for from effective field theory that holds for this type of Singularities that uh, appear in the uh, in the uh, in, in the action and in the in the equations of motion. Now there are other kinds of curvature singularities which are also interesting to notice uh, because not all. I mean, like I emphasized at the beginning, not all curvature singularities should be treated the same. Um, so the previous argument holds for scalar polynomial curvature singularities, but not for curvature singularities where only some of the components of the Riemann tensor diverge. So it could be that all scalars are, are finite, and yet uh, the Riemann tensor diverges. Horowitz and Itzaki show that gravitational shock waves of the following form uh, cannot receive any higher order corrections, because all the, st all the scalar quantities that one can build from the Riemann tensor are sorry, I should not say. Um, yeah, actually, they are 0. They, they are actually 0, yes. Um, so what I have here is, well, some, uh, some probe metric, which uh, for this, for the, in, in this case, it's taken to be either the Minkowski or the Antivisitor metric. And then we have a correction, which represents uh, a shock wave traveling, uh, well, along the direction uh, u equals zero, light cone direction, so traveling at the speed of light, it has, uh, this f is a harmonic function. And P is the null momentum of, of a massless particle. Now, what, what these people show is that this is an exact solution of whatever series of corrections you might have. And that's based on the geometric properties on the correction, on the fact that the correction depends on this du squared and, and not something else. So it, it depends on the specifics of uh, the Riemann, how the Riemann tensor looks like. Now, still, this metric satisfies Einstein's equations with the stress energy tensor of a massless particle containing a delta function. So in particular, it contains uh, a singularity, some kind of singularity. 
Um, but physicists do not regard these kinds of curved singularities usually as particularly problematic. So, um, so, so I should say that already, if you look at the at the physics literature, you see a different treatment of of the different singularities. Okay, so let's. Um, so now uh, we move on to the second section. Um, so I give the the microphone to Karen now. We'll now turn to briefly introduce the singularities in quantum field theory. Uh, of course, uh, the framework of quantum field theory, it's mathematically ill-defined. Uh, there's a lot of divergences and infinities that pop up various places. Uh, in particular, a perturbative calculation of any physical process uh, requires a summation over all possible intermediate states. Uh, and this implied that there's infinitely many possible states. You have to do this at all orders of perturbation theory you end up with divergent integrals go to infinity. And this really stems from the, the heart of the formalism. Uh, in particular, this integration over all the momentum energy states, infinite many, compared uh, also with the local nature of the dynamics, the point light interactions. So how do we get around this? Uh, we introduce a, a finite valued cutoff. So instead of integrating up over all of the possible modes, uh, you just integrate up to an arbitrarily large uh, value. Uh, and then, so introduce this cutoff, renormalize your parameters, and you get a theory that gives you finite answers. It becomes predictive, and also it becomes very, very successful. It works very, very well. And Strikingly and crucially, uh, the low energy physics that we're actually working with is largely insensitive to the manner in which this cutoff is introduced. So the high energy physics is severely underdetermined given our quantum field theories that we're working with. So this is quite a suspicious state of affairs, of course, and one response is to turn to uh, AQFT the attempt to develop a new formulation of QFT, putting it on a rigorous, well-defined mathematical footing uh, in which these divergences just don't arise. So instead of introducing these informal renormalization techniques to treat the interactions, uh, they postulate mathematically rigorous axioms uh, in axiomatic QFT, and then uh, they construct models in the second stage of uh, these axioms, constructive states of QFT. Uh, of course, algebraic QFT or AQFT is the most promising proposal for the axiomatic quantum field theory. So this program is quite explicitly motivated by uh, the divergences in uh, conventional quantum field theory. But it's not an attempt at formulating a theory of quantum gravity. It doesn't take these divergences to be indicating uh, kind of physics beyond quantum field theory itself, um, but wanting a firm theory uh, that we can work with that's conceptually uh, workable uh, at the level of quantum field theory. So taking it as a combination of quantum mechanics and special relativity. Um, so I'm talking about uh, Fraser's work here. So that's one approach to resolving or res avoiding the singularities in quantum field theory. The more standard approach, however, uh, is to treat quantum field theory itself as an effective framework. So it's expecting it to fail at some very high energy scale. So on this view, the divergences are typically seen as unproblematic. Um, because the theory is expected to be replaced at high energies anyway, uh, and we're not thinking of it as a fundamental theory, why worry about these divergences? Uh, especially given the incredible success of QFT as it stands. So it's push against uh, reformulating it at the level of QFT. Instead, we're looking for a theory of quantum gravity anyway. So we shouldn't be bothered by these divergences or uh, even more strongly, 
we might view them as indication or a, a symptom of the fact that the theory is failing at some point and that we need this new physics uh, beyond. Um, but the question that I'd like to ask is really why we expect this. So why do we expect uh, new physics beyond quantum field theory? Why do we expect it to be a non-fundamental framework? Of course, there are other motivations for this. You know, the fact that it's not taking into account general relativity, for instance. Um, but it seems like also a lot of the motivations for, for thinking this theory is going to fail is coming from these actual divergences in the theory. Uh, sorry, I should say particular theory. Um, so I think we need to, to think about this a bit more carefully and kind of think why, how, to what extent these divergences are motivating the need for the new theory or not. Um, the problem is uh, that I would say on their own, they don't point to the need for uh, a finite or singularity free theory of quantum gravity beyond. And of course, the reason for this is precisely because this high energy physics is completely, uh, not completely, largely underdetermined by quantum field theory. So we have very little indication of what lies beyond. It's not necessarily uh, a finite theory of quantum gravity. So as uh, Wallace uh, clearly lists, there are a lot of different possibilities. We could have another field theory, which in turn might need its own high energy cutoff as well. We might have a non-field theory uh, without infinities. An example could be string theory. It might be that there is a real lattice structure to space, kind of uh, when taking the cutoff, you're viewing that in a physical sense that would literally just cut off uh, space in this way. Uh, and, or there might be another form of space-time discretization. So this is kind of the more popular uh, approach in the quantum gravity literature, uh, either to presuppose space-time being discrete uh, or otherwise uh, use these other indications or arrive at space-time discreteness uh, in a way that's more sophisticated uh, than having this lattice structure to space. Or it could be some other as yet unimagined solution. So we have all these different possibilities for the high energy physics, um, and yet there's still this temptation to think uh, that uh, the, the divergences or the cutoff in uh, quantum field theory is somehow physically significant, that it gives us some information about the theory breaking down at high energy scales, uh, or the fact at least that it fails. So particularly given the success of this theory. Um, and this often comes from the analogy of quantum field theory applied to condensed matter physics, for instance, where in that case, uh, the breakdown of the, the theory uh, really comes because of a clearly physical reason. You know, the theory actually stops being applicable because of the atomic nature of uh, the matter that you're applying it to in condensed matter physics. Um, so people might think using this analogy that there must in turn be a discrete structure or atoms of space time uh, and because of the divergences in quantum field theory indicating this. Uh, and this intuition gets pushed as well because of its consilience with other arguments uh, that support a minimal length. But I'll come back to discuss this in the section four. Um, I'd like to briefly also mention the perturbative non-renormalizability of GR because this is another place where we have divergences uh, that's taken to motivate quantum gravity, um, commonly taken to motivate quantum gravity or particular features of quantum gravity. So this was an early attempt at quantizing GR, putting it in the framework of perturbative QFT. Um, but we have uh, indication that this theory is non-renormalizable, that it fails at the Planck scale. And uh, 
as uh, Niels and I explored in a paper, this is often really put forward as the problem of quantum gravity, mainly because if this theory didn't break down at the Planck scale, we would have a theory of quantum gravity. Um, so it motivates the search for quantum gravity, uh, but we stress it's as a theory that works at this Planck scale because that's where we want the theory of quantum gravity to work anyway. It doesn't itself motivate a, uh, a singularity free uh, version of quantum gravity. So this argument on its own, again, there are different possible uh, reasons why this theory is non-renormalizable, not necessarily that there's an actual space-time discreteness or otherwise an operational minimal length. Uh, and as I said, nor does it even motivate a finite singularity three uh, theory of quantum gravity. So we would urge caution in taking these results as indicating something physically significant due to its consilience with other arguments, again, including more general arguments from quantum field theory. Um, uh, in particular, it might be that even though this theory is non-perturbatively renormalizable, uh, sorry, it's perturbatively non-renormalizable, but it may be non-perturbatively renormalizable, in which case these divergences are coming up uh, to imposing the Procrustean bed of perturbation uh, where this uh, <clears throat> uh, method is not applicable in this case. And I'm pretty sure I took that phrase from Chris Richard because I think it's a great phrase. Okay, so uh, we'll now present the four different possible attitudes towards the singularities. And Seb will start with the, the first two here. So what we do in this section is we look at the physics uh, literature and um, well, we have studied how, wh what different attitudes uh, people take uh, towards singularities. So the question is, do singularities point to the, need, to the need for quantum gravity? So while many think that at least some singularities are undesirable and should be resolved, there is no consensus about uh, how, sh how, how this should be done. Uh, the resolution could be either classical or quantum, and actually also some singularities uh, might not need, uh, might not require a resolution at all. So of the four attitudes that we will discuss, in fact, only the second one, only the second attitude regards singularities as pointing to quantum gravity. So all the other, the three other ones do not uh, assume that we should, uh, that, that singularity should be result in quantum gravity. Now, I should also emphasize that, like I said at the beginning, there are various types of singularities in, uh, in particular in general relativity. And so surely these singularities um, will receive different treatments. Um, so it, it is possible to take one attitude with respect to one kind of singularity and another attitude with respect to a different kind of singularity. In particular, because some of the questions we will be interested in uh, concern the heuristics, so how uh, we should treat certain kinds of singularities. Um, now, in what follows our discussion uh, of the examples, I will I will discuss various examples, uh, but I don't intend to go into the details of the examples or even to evaluate the claims made uh, in the physics literature. But the, the 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 examples are for illustrative purposes of the four of the four attitudes. So the first attitude is that singularities are resolved uh, classically, and so they do not point to quantum gravity. This is the idea that the singularity should be resolved at the level of the current theory. So either in general relativity or in quantum field theory without going, without the need to go uh, for, to quantum gravity. So examples of this are the proponents of axiomatic quantum field theory, which uh, Karen already uh, mentioned before. Another example of this in GR is uh, some attempts to, uh, in the literature, to remove idealizations in GR and, and, and uh, remove the singularities, for example, the Schwarzschild singularity in this point, roughly you could say by smearing out a point particle. Uh, so there is early work by Parker and more recently Hansel and Steinbauer and others. 
um, that at attempt to do this. There are also um, higher dimensional resolutions of certain black hole singularities in the context of supergravity. So four dimensional solutions uh, that are singular are, are render, rendered non-singular when one goes to higher dimensions to higher dimensions. Uh, and in that way, one is also able to evade the singularity theorem, which is worked by Gill and Sarovitz and Townsend. Um, another example is the, is the Grava stars, which, um, are, which is a model that takes into account the back reaction of fields on an imploding star that forms a compact object. And the final result is, is an object similar to a black hole, but because of the um, special properties of matter inside uh, the black hole, actually uh, there is no singularity. Um, so the black hole actually doesn't form. So all of these are, are classical mechanisms, if you will, or, or, or mechanisms at the level of the current theories where physicists claim that um, the, 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 the singularities are, are resolved in some other way. So not by going to quantum gravity, but already at the level of Q of T or at the level of GR. Now, the second uh, attitude in, by, by contrast um, is, is when the singularities are resolved in quantum gravity. So we, we make, uh, so this assumption is made, is made that singularities signal the limitations of these effective theories and that they are to be resolved in quantum gravity. And there are two types of um, this kind of singularity resolution, uh, or rather of the way the singularity resolution is, is taken. One is that the singularities are physically significant and point to new physics. So we take the uh, the, the, the presence of a singularity, the appearance of a singularity as kind of in motivation or indication that there is a, a theory of quantum gravity uh, where the singularity will be resolved and that the singularity gives us some clue about, about that. So the attitude here is there is a problem to be solved versus blue skies research, one could say. So, so uh, what I mean by, by this expression is that is is the contrast be between, well, let's just solve quantum gravity in general versus let's try to serve, let, let's try to solve uh, a singularity and by doing so, find, find something out uh, about quantum gravity. Uh, so, so therefore singularities are uh, considered to be in this scenario or in this attitude are considered to be kind of um, scenarios or places where one can solve uh, things about quantum gravity. Now, an often used analogy here is the resolution of the instability of the hydrogen atom by quantum mechanics. Um, and, and this idea is sometimes uh, taken into quantum gravity through the idea of, of a minimal length. So that just like in the hydrogen atom, there's a minimum orbit uh, that is predicted by, by quantum mechanics and that prevents the electron from falling into the nucleus. In the same way, there is a minimal length in, uh, or analogously, there is a minimal length in quantum gravity, and that should prevent some types of singularities, like, for example, this Big Bang singularity. Bojewald is one of the people who have, ha have given concrete models of this type uh, without going into details, but discrete equations appear in some models of loop quantum gravity, where the quantum evolution is, uh, occurs in discrete time steps and does, does not break down when the volume uh, of the space goes to zero. Now here, the use of a non-perturbative approach is, is, is essential in this, even though it's a mini superstate approximation, but it's a non-perturbative approach. Uh, the second uh, type of attitude within uh, this general attitude too, is that, well, singularities are resolved in quantum gravity, but they don't particularly point to new physics. So it's a more mathematical or structural view of singularities. So um, singularities need to be resolved for reasons of mathematical consistency, perhaps for predictive power, but one remains non-committal about whether singularities will signal new physics or not. So singularities will be resolved by quantum gravity once a tidy uh, theory is developed, 
but we do not need to focus on the problems, on the problem of singularities, particularly since it's not a particularly deep problem in the, from the physics point of view. Now, a weaker version of this would be that uh, merely to ask the question, well, is there a theory of quantum gravity that resolves the singularities, Re regard regardless the value one gives to those singularities? Um, this by itself would be a motivation. If, if we can find a theory of quantum gravity that uh, resolves the singularity, that would be preferable uh, to, the, to one that, that doesn't. Um, now, examples of, of this are, uh, for example, in ADS-CFT, uh, some works um, take the boundary Young-Mills theory and uh, that is dual to the bulk uh, string theory and use it to study the singularity of a five-dimensional aviostructural black hole. And they do that through the study of the Weidmann functions in the boundary uh, Young-Mills theory boundary CFT. The argument is that the Young-Mills theory is in a compact space. It's, it's uh, in a, in a um, on a sphere, and the Weidmann functions uh, are only singular because the spectrum of the Young-Mills theory uh, has been approximated to be continuous. So, so the, the singularity is an artifact of a certain approximation, namely the large n limit. But fundamentally, the spectrum of the theory is finite. If n is discrete here, n is the number of, of colors in the theory. Um, and so the Weidmann functions cannot, cannot be singular because of the finiteness of the spectrum. And so if ADS-CFT is correct, then that would imply that the black hole singularity must also be resolved as well. So that's, uh, this, that's the 2B. There are other examples of this 2B attitude. Brandenburger and Waffe also use the physics of strings to argue that, uh, roughly speaking, that whereas particles point particles probe some of the space-time singularities, um, strings do not. So strings do not notice some of the singularities because of p-duality. So uh, roughly a large space is dual to a small space uh, and, and there is a transition region in between. So there is a maximum temperature, but the temperature actually never, never diverge, diverges and all of the physical quantities remain finite. So, so in this view, the, the, the fact that there is a singularity is an artifact of the fact that we are considering point particles rather than strings. Also, another uh, 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 physicist who has also uh, this view is uh, Kertetov. He views the divergences of in GIA as being of not great physical significance. So he sees them as merely mathematical problems in the theory. Uh, on this view, you don't resolve the singularities at any level. So you're really just at peace with them uh, or there's positive reasons for keeping them in your theory. So this view is one that would permit singularities even in a fundamental theory. So reasons for keeping them in the theory other than that they signal the limitations of effective theories. Uh, some examples of such reasons might be that you treat these singularities as physical in a very uh, strong sense, uh, not as indicating physics beyond, but that it's somehow inherent to the theory, uh, in the sense that even a final theory would be fundamentally incomplete. So it's somehow in the world. Um, well, debate this. Uh, another reason why you might want to keep singularities in your theories is that you view singularities as explanatory without pointing to new physics. So uh, maybe the view of Batterman or along these lines uh, with essential singularities. Or there might be examples uh, as we've found where the singularities are actually useful or required for stability. Uh, one possible example of attitude one that's treating it as physical uh, is this uh, Ehrman paper, uh, which he draws from Meisner on uh, tolerance for singularities in GR. He says, you know, given the incredible success of GR in all the domains we can test, uh, why not treat the, these features as predictions uh, in the good scientific realist sense? Um, he says, a source from which we can derive much valuable understanding of cosmology. 
So this is potentially a reason for keeping them in GR, um, but it could also motivate attitude to if you're using this as a uh, uh, valuable understanding of cosmology or prediction indicating a new physics or something beyond GR. So it could be either way, yeah. Um, another example uh, in the case where you might want to keep them because they're required for stability, we found this example from Horowitz and Myers. Um, but I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, the last uh, possible attitude to uh, singularities is indifference. So on this view, the singularities in our current theories, GR, quantum field theory, they don't matter because these theories are non-fundamental. So on this opinion or attitude, uh, you don't need a resolution at any level. You just uh, They're not telling us anything about physics uh, at this level, but neither do they tell us anything about quantum gravity. Or it may be that they do indicate something about quantum gravity, but we just don't know. So we have to treat them uh, with indifference. Uh, an example of this is um, Hosenfelder when she's talking about uh, perturbative uh, non renormalizability of GR, uh, given that this action uh, has this uh, non renormalizability we don't need to worry about it because it's not the fundamental action anyway. Um, and this is also an interpretation of even found him a bit hard to, to put in these different uh, attitudes. Um, but there's one view where we're tolerant because we just can't interact with these singularities. They're not going to cause us any problems. Um, uh, yeah, so if these singularities are unobservable, then we can be indifferent about them, tolerance in that sense. Okay, so in the last part, the, the fun, the fun sketchy part, uh, which I'll do quite quickly. Um, so some, these are just some remarks on the different attitudes that we're starting to think about now that we've categorized them. So for the following, uh, the point of the following discussion and in the paper, we're going to be assuming that GR and QFT are non-fundamental theories or frameworks, that we are expecting them to be in need of replacement. They're going to be replaced by quantum gravity. Uh, but we are also in this instance, assuming that quantum gravity is a fundamental theory. So against uh, Niels and I paper where we argued that you don't need to take this assumption. Uh, for the point of this talk, we are taking this assumption. So notice, firstly, that the four attitudes, they're not based on how we would classify or interpret the singularities. So for instance, it's not whether or not they're artifacts of the theory or whether there's something physical. It's more about how you then, um, what you then do with that. So if you're treating them as artifacts, what does that then motivate you to do? Do you look um, for a theory uh, at the same level uh, as QFT or GR? Do you then look for a new theory beyond as in attitude two? Um, are you just at peace with these singularities? Um, so having positive reasons for keeping them or are you just indifferent? So they're meaning nothing. So why might we take these different attitudes are some better motivated for particular singularities than others? Um, in the following, I'm just gonna make some very uh, general ham-fisted remarks without uh, even considering the different types of singularities. Just saying, why might we be motivated to take attitude to? Again, this part is really work in progress and really interested in your feedback on this as well. So, Attitude two comes in two varieties. The first one is where you think the singularities in our current theories are informative, meaning that they're indicating a physical problem and guiding us towards new physics. Uh, attitude 2B is just that quantum gravity should anyway be singularity free. Um, we might not take the singularities in our current theories as physical in the sense of being informative, 
but nevertheless recognize practical conceptual reasons for having no singularities in quantum gravity. So you could be neutral in regards to the non-fundamental or less fundamental theories, but find it necessary to not have singularities in a fundamental or more fundamental theory. Um, so I think we've seen already some of the reasons in the examples, uh, but also uh, I've had an attempt to articulate some of the conceptual reasons in um, considering the restrictions on a fundamental theory, the constraints in an uh, earlier paper. Um, so I'm not going to be discussing that so much today, more on this second uh, 2A attitude. Sorry, the first one, 2A. Um, why would we believe that our singularities are informative? Uh, some reasons why we might be skeptical of this attitude. So I think, you know, DR, it's where it's singular, it's being unreliable. It's not giving us predictions about these black holes or about the Big Bang. Uh, and similarly, uh, quantum field theory, or rather particular quantum field theories, also become reliable at high energies. Uh, for instance, quantum electrodynamics, which is believed to diverge at some very high scale. It's non-predictive there. So I just have this uh, strong intuition, this feeling that a theory ceasing to give us predictions can't itself be a prediction. So a theory failing would say that we can't trust it here. It says nothing. Uh, also, working on the assumption that we have independent reasons for expecting quantum gravity to be necessary for describing these very domains. So at very high energies, uh, at black hole singularities and at the Big Bang. Uh, in these domains anyway, uh, we have other reasons for expecting quantum gravity. I'm assuming uh, we need to look at this. Uh, so we're not trusting these theories in these domains anyway. So given that we have other motivations for quantum gravity, why would we need to interpret singularities as being informative or motivational or heuristic anyway? Uh, even if our theories, GR and quantum field theory, didn't have these singularities, we already have motivation to seek a theory of quantum gravity in order to describe these very domains because this is where quantum and gravitational effects are both expected to be important. And again, uh, we'd have reasons to be suspicious of our theories uh, because of these, uh, even if it did describe these domains, even if it did yield well-defined predictions. So I would say that it's not the singularities that are motivating QG. Um, but uh, of course, we really need to look at these uh, other motivations for seeking a theory of quantum gravity and why we expect it to be necessary in precisely these domains. Are these independent reasons or are they really coming from uh, these divergences or other divergences? So this part is going to be important, I think. Uh, Turning lastly to uh, whether singularities motivate particular features of quantum gravity. So could we take them as guiding us towards, for instance, a minimal length? Uh, in this case, uh, you might think, well, we have all these different indications, many different heuristic arguments. We have these different analogies, you know, with a condensed matter or the Bohr atom um, and a lot of semi-classical results. And although each on its own is not much or not very trustworthy, the fact that we have so many, uh, could we treat them together as potentially indicating a minimal length? If you do think that, uh, then even though the divergences in quantum field theories wouldn't imply the existence of a minimal length, the existence of a minimal length would somehow explain these divergences. So in that case, you might want to think, yeah, we can take these singularities as informative. But again, I think we really need to be cautious here. We need to look at these different motivations, assess exactly how strong they are, if they're necessary, but also how independent of each other they are. Um, in particular, whether or not they're all coming out of the same kind of source material and it's just a self 
self-supporting uh, argument. Another reason for caution here is that the analogies can pull in both directions, you know, uh, as well as this condensed matter analogy and the analogy of the Bohr atom. Of course, we also have uh, a historical analogy, Heisenberg's reaction to Fermi theory. He thought that, that the breakdown of that indicated a minimal length, and yet he was um, shown not to exist. So, yeah, I think we need to really be uh, careful here of what we're taking from the singularities. Um, we do, however, think that this argument from effective field theory that Sebastian presented could be an argument for uh, attitude two. Okay, so that's it. Uh, here is the summary of our four attitudes. Um, and I guess we'll leave it at that. We can start with uh, Eric. So please, Eric, go ahead. Thank you. So, um, so uh, Karen and, and Sebastian, thank you very much. That was a very rich, interesting talk. I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with one and then maybe I can throw myself at the end of the queue and see if there's time. I'll ask uh, more at the end. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical about um, your, the way that you describe your attitude in, um, in discussing your, the possible attitudes that one can take towards uh, singularities. You said that your, your classification of the four attitudes are not based on how we classify or interpret singularities, but um, how we respond to them. But it's not clear to me at all that, and actually seems um, implausible to me, that we can have any kind of substantive, well-informed response to them without Think without having an interpretation of them, without thinking about how to interpret them, without thinking about how to classify them. And that in fact seems um, to be uh, throughout, uh, throughout Karen's discussion of, of all the different, of the different attitudes, she seemed over and over again to talk about what the, interp what the uh, interpretation of the singularity was that was driving that response. So uh, um, can, can you please clarify what, what, uh, what, what the methodology is in, in this section? Uh, thanks. Yeah, we're still working it out in this section. So those were just my uh, initial thoughts more than anything else. Um, but what I meant um, is really, uh, it's not one, the way we've uh, gathered up these different attitudes, for instance, uh, by looking at the, the literature. Um, obviously, in each case, the people using it, well, maybe not in each case, but in most cases, people using these different attitudes, it's because they're taking a different interpretation of uh, the singularity and then how they're going to respond to it uh, based on their own attitude. Uh, what I meant was that it's not uh, at this stage, but of course, we need to look at it more and actually sort this out. Uh, at this stage, um, whether you're viewing it as an artifact, um, you could then take a different attitude to it. So uh, different, you can have one interpretation, but for other people, it might motivate a different attitude is what we're saying. There's a variety. And instead of classifying it like more, uh, I guess on our own evaluation, it's more of a collective, here are the different responses rather than how do we actually evaluate the singularity. So yeah, the next stage, I think we'll be looking more about uh, uh, critically evaluating exactly what kind of response or what attitude is warranted by what kind of interpretation. Okay, th th thanks, that helps. Uh, Chris Utrich said he has a comment in chat, so. Please, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, it, I think it's probably a trivial point, uh, but I mean, I find the classification of different attitudes towards singularities very useful, but I see absolutely no reason why we somehow have to commit to one attitude at, you know, at the exclusion of the, all the other attitudes we can take because Presumably, which attitude we take may very well depend on what kind of singularity it is, 
uh, I mean, mathematically speaking, which category it falls in, maybe physically speaking, how we interpret that failure of the mathematical framework uh, to have a relevance. And so I, my attitude, which maybe is the fifth attitude, would be to kind of, you know, pick any one of the four attitudes as seems to be fit for the particular case at hand. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's why I think uh, I should preface my comments at the end as being more uh, uh, provocative <laughs> in a way, and not as nuanced as uh, where we'll get. It's really the first pull, and is not taking into account even. Um, uh, we need to look more closely, in particular, at these different cases in the physics for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so in the chat, I uh, see that uh, Ajir Roshangar has uh, some comments, so you can go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I've been, um, um, like singularity is one of the most um, interesting subject for myself and your talk was very interesting for me. So, but I think like my take on this is like, um, my own take like on singularity i come from a mathematical background so i i was introduced to singularity in like calculus and so on so but like i think what gives us it's very it's an explanatory kind of device like this the simplest the simplest case of singularity that i can think of in mathematics is like in the field r when uh, the function one over x um, at the value of zero. So I think that point, the, the point uh, of one over zero tells us something fundamental about the field R, which is, um, which is that, that you can divide it as much as you want. There is no limit to the division uh, and there is no actual place, um, like the, the way we think about um, the natural number, like the ordinals and the um that sequence it's it's kind of different it's kind of has this infinity um kind of um intertwined in the whole structure it, it kind of tells me this a singularity is not a point it's not an artifact for for me at least in mathematics it's actually the most important point which gives us information i think it's the kind of the same in in, in physics because um so around these problematic points and around these, and they're not just like problem, problematic points. They are, um, they are essential points. Like you can have a problem and solve the problem, but this kind of, uh, the singularity is a problem in which if you solve it, um, like it's it kind of the whole system breaks down. I don't know, I don't, I, what's, your, what's your take on this? Mm. Mm. I mean, is in physical theories, it's really how you then um, interpret it. Like, is it pushing towards something physical or, or not? Um, meaning, it could it tell you about, um, okay, it, it tells you about the theory itself in a way, or if it tells you about physics at that level and you want a new theory at that level, or if it's telling you about something beyond the theory. So <clears throat> for instance, in um, where we have the, the one over R squared um, forces in classical mechanics, that's uh, interpreted as an artifact because uh, it's due to uh, approximations we're making uh, in describing these laws, for instance, um, center of masses, um, when in reality we'd say these objects are extended and there is no point you know, where R will go to zero. It's just a, an artifact of the, the uh, approximation that we formulated the theory in, um, a simplification anyway. Um, so that's not physically informative. Um, and it, you can say it motivates a new theory if you find that uh, problematic. Um, 
but otherwise it's, it's not necessarily indicating something very deep physically is the point. Thank you. Thank you. Yuyush has a question. Please go ahead. Um, it's more of a comment. Thanks very much, Karen and Sebastian, for the great talk. Um, maybe it's a slightly provocative, uh, but on the other hand, I think perfectly natural attitude. Um, so, or rather, another motivation for having what you described as attitude free, at least with respect to curvature singularities. And I don't necessarily endorse this attitude myself, but it's perhaps sort of worth to put it out there. Um, and the, the motivation would be that we do not need resolved singularities because it's great to have singularities uh, in classical GR. And uh, it's great to have them because they can protect us from some undesirable um, physical properties. Um, I think the best example of that would be um, if these very, or strong cos very strong or strong cosmic censorship turned out to hold, that would protect us uh, from various forms of indeterminism. Uh, but the way that we establish a strong cosmic censorship is by establishing blow up of certain quantities in certain regions. So by establishing that generic initial data have certain sorts of singularities. And in that sense, it's great to have singularities. Yeah, maybe uh, Sebastian wants to comment a bit more on this, but... Um... <laughs> Aren't the singularities themselves the source of the problems as well? Um, well, some sorts of singularities are the source of the problem and perhaps some other singularities are the source of a solution. Uh, the source of this problem are Cauchy horizons and mm -hmm. the resolution of the problem could be perhaps blow up of um, yeah, either curvature invariance or, you know, renormalized stress energy tensor or some other object like that. Yeah, um, let me add something. Yeah, I, actually, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that uh, position. Um, there, there's a paper by Horowitz uh, that argues that um, if, that, that, that for example, the Schwarzschild singularity, that it is there for a good reason, uh, namely to uh, protect us from negative masses so so that if 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 there if there wasn't a singularity um so if the singularity could be resolved then we wouldn't have reason to have a, to have a lower bound on the, on the mass so so i i agree that and actually you know thinking about this i'm um i mean i'm not in one position or another because i i see both arguments for um uh, why singularities have certain, um, can have certain roles in the theory, but also some other arguments uh, get against them. So th thanks for your comment. Eric. So uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which almost everything we know about singularities in GR actually doesn't depend on the Einstein field equation at, at all. And I mean that, um, it, I, I, what, what I mean by that is that all of the, all, every single known singularity theorem, I think I, I, think I will actually make, make, make that strong claim. Every single, well, every single singularity theorem I've ever looked at, and I've spent a lot of time looking at them, does not, does not depend on the Einstein field equation. One doesn't need to assume it in order to prove the theorem. Um, so get, given that it, it's always, therefore, I think one should really be cautious in saying that singularities point to the breakdown of general relativity as a theory, if one takes the Einstein field equation as a crucial, essential you know, part of the heart of the theory, which I think is reasonable to do. So uh, given that fact, uh, taking that into account, would, how does taking that fact into account modify, or if at all, you think the, uh, your, your analysis and discussion of the kinds of attitudes we might take towards singularities as, as indicating a breakdown of GR. Yeah, so, so actually I, I completely agree that uh, the singularity theorems, uh, well, they, they assume negative expansion and positive energy conditions, but indeed they don't, so they, they require certain properties of the curvature, but not necessarily the Einstein equations. I, I completely agree uh, with that. 
and um, so the uh, the Einstein equations in our talk really entered only in the effective field theory argument, which was about the curvature singularities. Um, so, so not so much about the geodesic geodesic incompleteness. Um, so, so, so yeah. I mean, I I, I agree with that, and um, it doesn't really modify the effective field theory argument. The, the only, I guess the only point of contact is if you want to use the effective field theory argument in the context of geodes ge geodesics. Uh, so to say that there are certain geodesics where the curvature is going to be infinite and then you get a problem. But I mean, like I said, I, I don't myself, um, well, and actually in the literature, the, um, it's not necessary to always regard it like that. It really depends on the, on the kind of theory you have and on the, your, your interpretation of GR. So if you take GR with point particles, then, then, then that's true. Then, then, that would be, um, then, then that would be a consideration. But if you take uh, strings or some other objects, then you have to look at, at other types of, of observables. Okay, thanks. Um... Uh, since I'm not seeing for the moment uh, raised hands, I, I have a question. Um, so uh, you said when, when you mentioned, I think the third attitude uh, towards singularity is the one that, let's say, come into terms, uh, come in peace with, uh, with the singularities. Uh, you said that one can think of singularities as uh, signaling some sort of uh, uh, incompleteness in, uh, in the world. So I was trying to figuring out uh, as a, how a metaphysician uh, can make sense of this fundamental incompleteness of the world. So I was thinking about uh, so a, an epistemic uh, kind uh, of um, explanation in the sense that uh, um, uh, singularities uh, tells us that there is some thing that is fundamentally unknowable, even in principle. Uh, or you can take also an um, ontological turn and say that singularities are some sort of glitches in, uh, in reality. Um, both, uh, both options, I, I think, are in intriguing and also, let's say, worrisome, because, of course, if you are a metaphysician with some uh, uh, empiricist inclinations, you wouldn't like your theories to tell you something like that, this, this inc incompleteness in, uh, uh, in, in the world, because you want your physics to tell you what everything there is to know about the world. So I was curious to uh, know uh, uh, your, your take on this, uh, this kind of interpretation. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm curious to explore these as well. Um, so in the, the first interpretation, um, Niels and I thought about this before when we were considering whether a fundamental theory would have to be UV complete or not. Um, and we kind of thought, well, yeah, exactly. If it's not UV complete, what does that mean? That there's a, that we just can't describe the world beyond this theory. Uh, there may or may not be something beyond it. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting, but also the, the other option that it's, um, so rather than taking it as a description and a, a limitation in our description, is it an actual real physical thing in the world? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about this. Um, uh, so I've been looking at, I found a recent paper, or a recent two years ago paper uh, from Ellis, who's really quite um, uh, down on, on singularities and thinks there shouldn't be any infinities in, in physics um, because they just don't make sense. So we should use it as a constraint. But yeah, it wasn't clear whether he meant this in a deep metaphysical sense or more of a practical sense in, in our physics. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's funny that most other physicists aren't so 
immediately bothered by infinities in general. You know, they think we can deal with them. Maybe there are an infinite number of galaxies in the universe. Maybe the universe is infinite. We will find out, you know. Um, but Ellis, on the other hand, takes it as really strong. No, there's no infinities. There just can't be. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this is an interesting part to look at as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, if later you could share uh, this, um, this reference, uh, Ellis reference, so then I can take a look. Thank you very much. Uh, so in the meanwhile, Pedro raised his hand. So Pedro, please go ahead. So um, thanks uh, everyone. Thanks Karen and Sebastian for your talk. I, I would like to, to have some comments um, regarding the, the attitude uh, towards uh, singularities in general, because uh, you've uh, focused on the basically either they point towards new physics or just as a mathematical uh, artifacts or the theory, either GR, QFT, or both. So uh, I would like to, to have uh, some comments because uh, I mean, it's something that given that your ex almost uh, exhaustive survey of the literature, uh, there is some sort of approaches uh, to, to basically physics in general, which uh, basically bypass as a bonus. As they are not tailored towards uh, singularities themselves, but just as a kind of bonus or for free to get rid of them. And one of these is uh, in particular the classical level. So you don't have to, to incorporate any quantum effects, uh, either from uh, putative uh, quantum gravity theory or just uh, some, for example, AQFT, where you just uh, deem that these uh, singularities are mere mathematical pathologies to be discarded when you have uh, rigorous treatment. So at the classical level, if you focus on purely relational approaches, and I'm thinking here of this, uh, I guess that people in the, in the audience uh, are aware of this approach, which uh, goes back to basically Julian Barber, which uh, basically takes uh, this uh, new approach to classical gravity, which is in the literature is known as uh, moderate shape dynamics, which is basically sort of a reformulation, if you like, of GR, but uh, with traits, basically uh, this space-time DFO invariance for just special DFO plus uh, vile conformal uh, transformation. So it's uh, scale uh, is, uh, is not absolute, absolute scale has no meaning. So in this uh, particular approach, some recent papers, okay, by recent, I mean uh, perhaps uh, two, three years ago by Tim Koslowski, David Sloan, and uh, Flavio Mercati, where they basically analyze in the simplified cosmological models. In particular, they focus on the so-called this Bianchi cosmologies, uh, Bianchi 1, Bianchi 9, Carrie Colwell, and they basically are able, because of this uh, meaningless of absolute size, in the shape dynamics, they are able to go through what in GR would be so-called Big Bang. I'm focusing here on just uh, cosmological singularities, so uh, not, not singularities in general, in particular, not about black holes. So in this case, just by remaining, I mean, insisting on this uh, relational uh, observables, I mean, the magnitude that you have to be within the, the, your model, I mean, you are able to bypass uh, this uh, potentially unbounded magnitude of curvature or some other stress energy tensor at this uh, Big Bang. So the, the point is that in this case, singularities are perhaps not even an artifact of GR, even if they are, but uh, the thing is that uh, if you take a uh, basically more general approach, so it's not just, we have this problem with singularities. So we have to do something with them, either this is this kind of four attitudes. Uh, so it's really relevant because it's no fundamental theory. Some quantum gravity theory will come as to rescue. 
the point is that basically from uh, rather general principles which are motivating i mean this uh, shape dynamics approach you basically get rid of basically just dissolve the issue at, at all of course i mean again i, I should say that this is uh, this is not uh, uh, compelling in the sense that it's just working for uh, some uh, homogeneous but inosotropic models like Bianchi cosmologies. So work has to be done regarding, I mean, the full generality of, of the approach because it takes this so-called BKL conjecture, which uh, has been proven to be uh, applicable in many cases, in, in particular, Quiescent cosmological singularities, but not, but not in full GR. So, okay, sorry, just as a wrap up, the thing is that uh, uh, singularities uh, might uh, be some artifact of, of your theory, in particular this uh, GR, but uh, they are also uh, basically bypassed by focusing on different. Uh, principles which are a priori independent of just solving singularities themselves. So, um, so well, just, just that as a, some sort of addition to, to your already uh, quite yeah. exhaustive, I mean, uh, uh, survey of, of the literature regarding your, your four attitudes uh, mm -hmm. towards uh, singularities. So yes, any comments that uh, you may have? Uh, I think it might, um, well, you think it could indicate attitude one where the singularities get resolved uh, kind of at the level of the, the theory of GR, um, but it's also, you know, helping um, without taking the singularities as motivation, um, but nevertheless, they get resolved. Um, something like this. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> that would be the case. Also, just to point out, uh, uh, yeah, the fact that they are not basically the motivation themselves to basically to, to seek for any sort of new physics or even mathematical, uh, basically, treatment of your current theories. Yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah. A good Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. So, Joanna Lutz has a question. So, Joanna, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so, my comment is that it seems to me that the difference between attitude 2A and B seems to be somehow more subjective than the other uh, differences in the sense that I can imagine two researchers, one taking an attitude to A, the other one taking an attitude to B, who in the end arrived at the same theory, but using different motivations. Uh, and in such case, in the end, they will agree on all claims about the reality. They will disagree only on how they arrived to this claims, which is not perhaps an, uh, itself a difference <laughs> uh, concerning uh, reality, but only what's it's easier for a given person or something like this. Whereas um, uh, at least at first glance, it seems to me that if I take any other pair of attitudes, then they should disagree in some claims about reality, not only in the preferred methods. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, thanks. So yeah, exactly. We're interested in how they can be used. Um, so even if they're used, yeah. So in one, they're, they're used differently by the the person using them, taking it as a guiding for a different reason. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because they've arrived at the same theory and uh, having a quantum gravity without the singularities. 
Um, so yeah, that's a good point. I think what we would also be interested in is, um, I guess the next stage is using it as a constraint in a way, um, or whether they can be used as a, a what do you call it, a means of um, confirmation rather than just a guiding principle. And that would be more interesting than the, the motivational point. So that's a really good uh, point to motivate. Thanks. Eric. Well, I'm just gonna keep on going until you stop me. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Um, uh, th this is a question particularly for Karen. Um, when you were discussing at the end, um, attitude 2A, you said, and I, I think you were careful here to emphasize that this was your personal point of view, not, not necessarily something to attribute to, to Sebastian as well. <laughs> but um, you, you said that GR, uh, I, I wrote it down, so I'm not sure I'm quoting you exactly, but I, I think it's very close. General relativity is unreliable, not predictive about black hole singularities and cosmological singularities. And I, I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because it seems to me that one can take um, two different attitudes here. Well, I don't mean attitude in your sense, I'll maybe think about a different word. One can um, think about this in two different ways. Um, from, from, a, from a kind of glo global four dimensional point of view, one can simply say, look, singularities aren't part of space time. There's no point of space time at which, a sing at which there is a singularity. So GR makes predictions about the entirety of space time, no problem. Done, or you can take uh, perhaps a, a more local kind of a you know, three plus one evolutionary kind of view, and say what GR predicts. In fact, is that some is that some observers will um, will not be able to make predictions after a certain finite proper time of their existence. Mm -hmm. That's a perfectly that is a perfectly determinate. Uh, it seems to me conceptually clear prediction to make. After a certain after a certain period of you know, after a certain finite period of proper time, you, sorry sucker, will no longer be able to make predictions. Done. So, what, what what is wrong with either of those two attitudes or those, those two ways of thinking about it? Uh, nothing as far as I can see. So yeah, thanks. I think this is something I obviously didn't take into account um, in kind of uh, pushing this view. Um, but that's a that's definitely clarifying um in what sense can we mean them as predictions and that's some good examples where of senses in which they could be taken as predictions yeah um i should say too i've seen some papers i mean of course ehrman um but also i've seen some work by james wells who you know arguing in what sense um uh, these singularities mean that GR is broken down and they can't find any clear sense or explain different definitions of what it means to break down, things like this. Um, so yeah, we didn't go into that um, uh, because I think it's pretty, uh, pretty clear what they say. So yeah, I should have taken that into account when writing it and I will, thank you. Thank you. Alvaro, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, so yeah, also was wondering, uh, so how much is general relativity broken down? Um, and I was thinking in the case of um, two black holes that uh, are moving together and merging. So if black holes are singular and problematic, how can we describe them so well, and how can these predictions be made? Maybe there are some approximations in play. Maybe uh, it's just general relativity that predicts that you can have two black holes, two singularities moving. If this makes sense in and merging together, so I don't know if you had thought about this and if this should influence my attitude towards uh, singularities in general relativity. I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. No, uh, Sebastian. Yeah, I, I can say something. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the, the question, but um, I mean, as I view it, the um, uh, um, so, so these simulations take take gen general relativity uh, to be to be valid, um, and uh, and and it is valid. 
I mean, you, you don't really need to get to the singularity to do this calculation. So, so you, you only need to uh, study the, the region uh, outside the horizon. Of course, that, that region is, is being changed, but that's all well outside the singularity. Um, of course, it, it could be that. Um, so, so this is really um, yeah interaction of two large objects like we could have two stars or, or, or um, so, so, so there will be, I mean, what, what, it, it could be that at some point uh, general relativity will break down and, and that the accuracy will not be enough. And, and that's actually something that one would hope even that, you know, that we might be able to test some of these uh, higher curvature predictions that maybe if you look for very long times that, that eventually you will be able to see some departure from general relativity of, or, or if the collisions are uh, at very high energies or if you include other factors like spin and so on to see some departure from general relativity. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, so far, I think it's not at least, I think it's not uh, extremely surprising that, that they haven't been, been seen. Um, uh, but of course, this is this is, it, it, the, the field is still. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but the still is field is still in its infancy. So hopefully, in the next few years, as they get more accurate measurements, they can also see some of the departures of of general relativity. Eric has a finger on that. So please. Yeah, so, so, um, so Sebastian, I, um, I largely agree with what you said, but I think one has to be um, a, a little a little careful here. With regard to extreme, extremal and near-extremal black holes, because um, uh, pl plausibly one can take a Cauchy horizon as a kind of singularity. It certainly is a breakdown of determinism or predictability in some sense, at, at, at a minimum. And uh, many studies, in fact, show that, that the Cauchy horizon is unstable inside Kerr and Reiser Nordstrom. And so, and, and it, it's expected that it will, you know, it, it becomes it becomes truly singular in sense of a curvature singularity under small perturbations. And the reason why this is relevant is because, of course, the Cauchy horizon, um, as black holes, as Kerr and Roger Nordstrom black holes um, approach extremality, the Cauchy horizon and the event horizon uh, approach each other and, be, and at extremality, in fact, more or less coincide. So, and th this is especially relevant because essentially all work in quantum gravity on black holes and every program of quantum gravity I know of focuses on extremal or near extremal black holes. And they, but they, they always make the, usually, usually without even remarking on it, they always ignore the fact that the Cauchy, that the Cauchy horizon, which by, by classical arguments, we expect to be singular, is sitting right there at the event horizon. So I, I think that the, the kind of answer you give is okay for not, for not extremal, for really non-extremal black holes, but I think there really is a lot to think about and uh, more care needs to be given in th thinking about that kind of response when we're dealing with extremal and near extremal black holes. Yeah, uh, and we may have a semantic uh, issue. So I used the word uh, extreme, but I meant high energies. I didn't mean extremal in the sense of the charge is, is equal to the mass. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was thinking, in my answer, I was indeed thinking about the astrophysical black holes, which, yeah. are, the, which are all, all, all have zero charge. Um, yeah, I, I reckon. I yeah, I, I, I understood that. I was just saying everything you're saying. I think sounds to me right for astrophysical black holes. But the, but but when one is doing theoretical studies and almost all work in quantum gravity, do do work on extremal black holes in the sense of a equals you know a equals m or q equals m. And the, that I think one needs to be real a lot more careful in the in that kind of work with regard to the, to the issues that you were just discussing with Alvaro. Uh, for, for these kinds of black holes, more careful than people usually are. Okay, thank you. Um, so, is there any other question or comment? You, you, I, I, I can see you. I have, a, I had some question. Uh, so first, you, you, and then, uh, and then you. Okay. Okay. is that um, mm, there is also a sort of logical space in your classification for a singularity resolution which does not require full resources of a quantum gravity theory 
um, but nevertheless, it's not a classical resolution in some sense. Uh, so all sorts of semi-classical QF thinkers, space-time based proposals could fit into this. And I think it, what's philosophically interesting is that many routes for having some sort of a semi-classical singularity resolution seem to be closing uh, in the sense that we do know now that analogs of Penrose's singularity theorem could be derived with very weak assumptions with average energy conditions and also using a generalized uh, second law as Aaron Wald showed. Um, and so this would suggest that although there could be a space for some sort of intermediate level where singularities could be resolved, the prospects for that seem to be rather dim, which is philosophically interesting, I think. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, you wouldn't put that at the, as an attitude one, it's kind of resolved at the level no it's an in-between level that's what you said I, I would think so yeah yeah because this either semi-classical gravity or qf tinker space time seems to me to be neither in camp two nor in camp like that seems to be to me rather different from axiomatic qft or super gravity or things like that yeah yeah okay that's interesting to think about um, yeah, I'm also interested in really the, the implications of this as well. So that's that's cool. Thanks. Okay, Ajir, it's your turn. Okay. I was wondering whether anybody has approached the problem of singularity in terms of uh, information theory. Because I think like we have a um, second law of thermodynamics, everything uh, goes into more entropy, but I think um, this this a black hole is kind of like the the um, it kind of, it kind of like a blank sheet. It doesn't give you any information. And in terms of information theory, just like um, um, where we start, we have every possibility to do as opposed to uh, like like it's not even every possibility, but it's just like infinitely uh, i don't know how to put it but 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 the, the, like back to my question has anybody mm, um tackled the question of uh, singularity in especially in gr in 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 terms of information theory do you know any like the information loss what? the information loss paradox or the holographic principle in uh, like i don't know how you approach it in physics but what i am thinking about is like a shannon theory bayesian kind of approach to information um, yeah i'm not an expert on that um okay all right but i think yeah you want to look at the the information loss paradox and the the resolution of this in the in the holographic principle. Maybe this has something to do with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? Vera has a question. Please, Vera. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen and Sebastian. So my question is more clarificatory. So um, a certain point you were talking about how to understand singularities as physical, and then you were um, uh, saying that by that you mean uh, whether they are informative. So when I think of like a physical attitude towards singularity, so a kind of like physical realist interpretation, I might be thinking of some tier of space time, you know, something very physical. Why I felt that you were meaning something different. So um, maybe a kind of feature that tells that your theory is not, um, I mean, that you, you need to elaborate uh, to, to move to a better theory, you know, more fundamental ones. So just wanted to hear about that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I was using it in both senses, kind of any physical interpretation, not necessarily that there has to be an actual singularity, uh, but even if there's a, a breakdown that's indicating something physical, uh, like the need for a new theory or the fact that the theory breaks down. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so I was using it in a broader sense there. I think uh, Eric gave some nice examples where we could also think of them as uh, physical predictions as well. Um, so there's many different ways of thinking about it, um, which I wasn't, uh, uh, I think, uh, careful enough with this. Uh, because yeah, it is a tough thing to, to think about physically. And, yeah. And I think uh, especially uh, what Antonio was saying, if you want to think about them as fundamental features of the world, what would that mean as well? I think is quite cool. Mm. That's more what you're interested in the metaphysics, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>